be very careful there. I didn't say that. I said the same as Mr. Chief. For instance, Mr. Mzinyati, they started off together. He was the DPP in Gauteng. He'd acted in that position for long periods of time, many times, successfully. He wasn't appointed. So, Why? Now, now um, I, I, um, I know uh, you, at, at one point uh, you said to yourself as a, as a hard-nosed, hard-headed prosecutor, I don't want to concern myself with politics. I just want to do my job. I love doing my job. Yes. I love nailing people. No, that's not true. Okay, I withdraw that. I, I, mm. I was being facetious, but mm. you, 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 obviously your, your sole task as a prosecutor mm. is to prosecute and convict. Uh, no, no, that's not your sole task as a prosecutor, Mr. Aronson. You okay. should know better than that. Okay. Okay. So, so maybe I should stay away from Perhaps you what should. you were uh, you an expert on. Mm. But, but certainly um, you are often judged uh, by your conviction rate as a prosecutor. Uh, the NPA chases conviction rates as a statistic. It's not something that I've ever been fond of because uh, I don't think that I need to tell you that. You're way more experienced than I am. Uh, a, successful a successful prosecution does not mean that it necessarily has to end in a conviction. A successful prosecution is where justice has been done. If you're guilty, you should be convicted. And if you're not guilty, you should be acquitted. And that is a successful prosecution, in my view. Yeah, as someone is brought to justice. Yes. Whatever the outcome is, yes. is determined by the, by the process of justice. I think we, we, we agreed on that. But I think the point that I wanted to get to is you, you, you achieved, eschewed politics at the time, but you are now a politician. I'm told that I'm a politician, Mr. Aronson. I accept that I'm perceived as one. Um, I have no way to avoid that. You're a better prosecutor. I'm a much better prosecutor. Okay. I'm a dreadful politician. Okay. Um, but you also know um, the constitution of our country. And, I know it reasonably and, and, well. And yes, you know that um, black people in this country, generic black, black African people, were denied the kind of opportunities that you may have enjoyed before 1990. I don't dispute that for a moment. And, and you also know where we were going, if for obvious reasons, um, for a Masjiba to compete with a, with a, I speak on subject to correction, with maybe a Mr. Ferreira or maybe even a Harry Nell. These are prosecutors who've been there for a long time it would have been impossible to compete with them because you just weren't in the system, you weren't given opportunities by the system. Um, Mr. Arnsa, I would like to differ with you. Uh, my experience of the competent black prosecutors, of which there are many in the NPA, is A, that they can certainly hold their own against any comers. And they don't need any kind of favour to be able to do that. It's my it's my experience of uh, prosecutors in the NPA, many of them, and I'm not generalizing, I'm many of them, not everybody. Then you get pretty useless white prosecutors too, I've got to tell you. And it's been my experience after I left the NPA in the world that I now move in. Also, very, very competent young black people who need no favors from any white people to succeed. They succeed all on their own, and they would be mortified to know that somebody thought they couldn't do it without a favour. No, I, th I, think, I think we're agreed. We, we've got good and bad white prosecutors. We've got good and bad black prosecutors. We've got good and bad male prosecutors and uh, white male prosecutors and we've got good and bad black ones. The point I'm getting to is that given the history of our country, it was also important for black people to be put and to be placed in leadership positions. I don't dispute that for a moment. It is a, a position that I supported, and demonstrably so. Mm. So to come back to the original question or line of question, at a time here you have a black female, black African female prosecutor 
with a lot of experience at 2011, more than 20 years okay. in the system. Mm. She knows how prosecution works. She's prosecuted in a court of law mm. probably many times. And um, she's now appointed to a high position. Why the shock? Why the surprise? Well, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, Mr. Arnsa, um I never regarded Ms. Jeeva as uh, needing some sort of affirmative action to assist her. Uh, I never gained the impression from her that uh, at the Office for Serious Economic Offences, and that's my only experience of her really as a prosecutor, that she needed um, any help. She was perfectly capable of uh, looking after herself and sorting herself out, and I think she did that. But are you, are you um, suggesting when she was appointed? I'm suggesting that, that when she, she was being helped. I'm suggesting, no, not necessarily. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that she was being helped. I'm suggesting that there was an ulterior motive for her appointment. Uh, Sir Milani was on his way out. We all knew that. Uh, Sir Milani had a stated objective. He stated it himself. And some, they needed somebody to replace Sir Milani who would uh, continue with that objective. And so, that was Ms. Jiba. So, so that is really now, now after a, a few minutes, we, we, we come to the real reason why you were unhappy with her appointment. I didn't say I was unhappy. I said I was surprised and shocked. You were surprised and sh shocked. Mm. Um, I didn't necessarily like it. It didn't cause me any unhappiness. It's because, you, n not because she wasn't qualified, not because she wasn't experienced, not because she was not a fit and proper person to be appointed, but because you thought that there was an ulterior motive behind her appointment. I most certainly did, and that she had demonstrated then, by then, uh, with the uh, involvement in the Celebi matter and the issues with Kheri Nell, that, uh, that she was not necessarily that fit and proper person, and that we had misgivings about that. Certainly I did, and so did others. Uh, that she wasn't necessarily a fit and proper person, and I, certain, I certainly had misgivings about her integrity. But you, you see, you, you're reconstructing your evidence now. I, I started at the beginning when you said that you were, you were surprised mm. at her appointment. I was. But you accepted it? Certainly. And you even congratulated who, her? Who am I to not so, accept so it? So why, why do you now backtrack and say, well, because at the time you didn't have these misgivings. That was not your evidence that you had misgivings about uh, uh, fitness and properness to be a, 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 a senior uh, public prosecutor leading the NPA, or have some misgivings about it because of some kind of ulterior motive. Mm. That was not your evidence. I think my evidence is clear, Mr. Aronser, that, that that is my view of mischief, and I've never made a, I've made no. Uh, secret of it, not then, not now, and not in between. I think Ms. Jeeva knows that's my view of her. It is my view of her. It was then my view of her. Now, we, we know that, that as much as, as, as the panel will be assisted uh, by your views because of your experience and your seniority uh, and, the, and the kind of work that you've done uh, when you were a senior public prosecutor, it will remain a view that you express. This my own other personal views. view. Yes. Mm. Nothing other, more. Other views, because you know that the mandate of this panel is to determine whether Ms. Jiba is a fit and proper person to be appointed or to have been appointed as either a, a, a deputy or the national director of public prosecutions on the basis of objective. Facts. Certainly. Now, at the time when she was appointed as the acting NDPP, you had a view. There weren't any objective facts to indicate that she was not or would not be a fit and proper person. You, you, you had some sense, some misgiving that our uh, Samalani. Uh, has now been removed, um, and now they're coming, they, whoever they are, and we talk about they, they whoever they are, have they, and now they've appointed Ms. Jiba. 
Is that, is that a fear of somebody? It's a, uh, let me put it this way, uh, Mr. Aron. So, um, I had a, a, a sense of disquiet uh, about uh, the integrity of Ms. Jibo after the, uh, a little bit after Celebi, but, uh, but I didn't know enough about it really. So there was this niggling thing, but nothing major. Certainly after the Gerinel uh, debacle, um, I had a different view. Um, I then seriously uh, questioned uh, her integrity as a prosecutor. Um, I wasn't personally involved in the matter, so I was basing my view on, on what I heard and had been told and read. Um, well, that, that's why, yeah. just, just to pause yeah. there, that's why I'm not going to go in, sure. in, 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 into so, that so avenue yeah, um, because you weren't personally... Yeah. You had but no if you're asking knowledge. if I had personal interaction with Ms. Jibo that demonstrated that, uh, that she was uh, lacked integrity, I have no personal, up to then, interaction with her that demonstrated that, no. In fact, your evidence is that you thought that she was quite a good administrator? Well, certainly when she was in my office, she had Mr. no difficulty. Mr. Aron, sir, you're going to have to speak louder than that, please. Am I speaking too softly? Maybe if you look at us, we'll speak louder. <laughs> I think just ensure that you project your voice into the mic. That will help. Thank you. Mr. Aron, I've heard you screaming at cricket matches. You can scream. <laughs> um. Um, uh, I know that too. My, my, my apologies. <laughs> my, 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 um, I clearly haven't been in a, an inquiry like this for a, for a while. Uh, I'm sure I'll get used to it quite, quite quickly. Um, so, so, yeah, Ms. Brayton, we, before we were interrupted, we were, um, you were talking about Ms. Jeeba, certainly. Oh, yes, I, I was putting to you that mm. even your evidence was that you had no qualms about uh, in my, administrative abilities. In my experience at my mm. office, I found no fault with her administrative abilities. Mm. Mm. Now, now, just in terms of, of what a, 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 a senior deputy or the national director, him or herself, does, um, it, 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 would lo it seems to me to be involved mostly management of cases, especially high-profile cases, important cases. Are you asking me about deputy national directors and national directors? Yes. Well, I have no experience of that post, so uh, it would be based on observations and conjecture on my part. Yeah. Uh, but yes, certainly they need to be, in my view, a good administrator. It would, it would be obvious, I think, to anybody that that is what that post requires, uh, in charge of a massive organization. So, would, so on your evidence, Ms. Jiba ticks that box? Well, I don't know. I'm talking about my little office in Pretoria where she had five or six or seven advocates reporting to her. It's a little bit different when you have two or three or four thousand advocates reporting to you indirectly. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all I'm saying is in my own experience, in my little office, I found no fault with her administrative capability. And, 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 so, and so also did your, your, some of your colleagues who um, have... Um, Mr. Ferreira, who's already testified. Um, Mr. McAdam, who's already testified. I accept that. Um, they, 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 they speak uh, quite positively about her abilities as an administrator, as a manager. They don't dispute it. And, and Mr. Gerard Nell, I think. Uh, Madam Chair, may I, I'm just reminded here, I made a note, I was asked to make a note during the lunch adjournment. Uh, what the arrangement is with the record, the running record, the transcript, because um, I was just reminded that, that Ms. Breitenbach had in her evidence this morning referred to reading the transcript of the evidence of Mr. Ferreira, and my colleague Mr. Rupp says that he had in fact requested a copy of the running record but was told it would only be made available once the evidence leaders had cleared it. I, I, I'm just a messenger. But um, I, I'm just thinking that... Madam Chair, I'm given an instruction that they should be emailed, and I think that the only thing... I, I have not received 
part one and uh, I basically sorted it out this morning with the Secretariat to email it to everybody. Okay. Uh, we have a running recording and the transcript is available daily, I'm made to believe. It is available, so you, if you ask for it, you will get it, if it is available. Um, it's not available daily, there is some lag time, so I think Advocate Ferraris became available Saturday afternoon or Sunday, um, and it was emailed onto Advocate Breitenbach so that I didn't have to lead it through the same kind of thing. Um, and I have said to them this morning to send what has come in thus far to everybody. So Thank you may just ask for it. If it is available, it will be given to you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Ms. Breitenbach, just to try and maybe uh, round off on, on, on this point. Um, whatever misgivings you had when, when Ms. Jiba was, was appointed as the acting NDPP, there were others as experienced, maybe more experienced, um, and you were surprised and so on. Um, at that point, you certainly didn't have any reason to believe based on the facts, that certainly was within your knowledge that she was not a fit and proper person to hold that position. I'm not sure that that's, that that's correct. I have said that I had serious misgivings about her integrity at that point. Um, but again, it's not for me to appoint national directors, it's not for me to say anything about it, it's not for me to do anything about it. I was a deputy director of public prosecutors, it's not a terribly uh, important or high rank. Um, and therefore, it was not my place to, to say anything about it, not my place to do anything about it. Uh, she was the acting national director and, and that is the position she held and, and, and we all uh, functioned in that fashion. Um, now, obviously we have a record and we'll look at the record and at the conclusion of the case we'll, we'll, we'll argue as a certain position but I certainly didn't hear you say at the outset of the evidence that you had serious misgivings about her integrity. I didn't hear that. I thought it was implicit when I said that uh, the requirements for such a post are integrity and uh, and a good grasp of ethics. No, the, we we agreed. Yeah. Uh, that that's a requirement for the yes. job. Um, that's a formal requirement, huh. like the interviews that you uh, that you ducked out of. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm being. Careful, but anyway, Mr. but, careful, but um, careful. you know, the, 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 the candidates were all interviewed and uh, quite rightly, a large Absolutely. part of the interview was, was focused on, on the integrity. Yes, of, I agree. Uh, yeah. Very important. I, I'm just trying to get from you as, as a witness mm. who's here to also assist the panel I know exactly to come where up with findings and the recommendations yes. that that was not your evidence at the outset. Your surprise related more to your evidence was a lack of life experience, a lack of, or rather in comparison or in relation to other uh, prosecutors. Mm, that's true. Black prosecutors. Yes. Um, and because you, to your credit, you say, no, you understand the situation in our country. So that's good. Mr. Arnstein, may I just say that I, I it's, it's, it uh, was my intention, and I certainly thought it was implicit. Uh, in my reply that yes I was shocked and I was surprised for this uh, unprecedented in my view elevation that it, it couldn't be based on skill and ability when there were other black people better qualified and more experienced so therefore there was a, a different reason uh, and I thought all of that was implicit in that reply if it wasn't then I'm certainly telling it to you now well I, 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 I do think um, that you you changing with and I obviously mean when we disagree, mm. it's always with due respect. Of course. But um, we, we went through what I thought was some of the obvious issues which mm. you had to agree with, that she's been a prosecutor for more than 20 years. Certainly. That she's had ample experience. She's seen the inside of a courtroom. Mr. Allen, um, if I had at that time a concrete reason at that time, 
to question her integrity with, with something real, then, then perhaps I might have. But I'm telling you it was my view, nobody else's view. It was my view gathered from things that had happened. Uh, I had no reason or anything concrete at that point that I could use against her. So if I had, I might have acted differently. I don't know, but I didn't have it, if that's what you're asking me. It's certainly my view and that's all. They, they, I had no piece of paper, nothing else that I could use. Now, just, just while we're on this point, just compare and contrast that with your response to, for example, of uh, Mr. Nkasana. Uh. You, you seem to like him. I do. What did you, when he was appointed, he had never ever prosecuted a case in a court of law. As I said, I went to the meeting with Mr. Nkasana with a view that he was just another stooge, that he was a puppet, that the appointment was ludicrous, and I went there ready to actively dislike him. Those were my views based on, on the fact that he had come from reasonable obscurity in KZN, that he was not a, a hotshot litigator, uh, that I'd never heard about him before. And all of that uh, informed my view, and it was a very unfair view, clearly biased. Uh, when I met the man, he, uh, he demonstrated um, a, a level of, of maturity that, that surprised me pleasantly. Uh, he was, he, he, when we had a discussion, he, he demonstrated a, a grasp of what the job entailed and the hugeness thereof and the difficulties that he would that he would face. Um, I don't know a lot about his background as an attorney. I know that he was an attorney. I don't know what, he, what his area of uh, expertise was. I'm basing my view on him, on my meetings with him, of which I had two, and on his actions in between those meetings, and his other actions within the NPA. Uh, but at my meeting with him, he, was a, he a, a came across as a sensible man, and a mature man, um, somebody who understood the, the role that he had taken on, uh, including the difficulties, and uh, he, he treated me extremely well, uh, he was polite, um, so I, all of the things that I had expected him to not do, he did, and that informed my view. He must certainly left his office with a, a completely different view of him than I had formed unfairly before I met him. Now, now just to, to, to roll back a few minutes, your, your evidence was that you don't know what the job entails. Of a national director? Yes. Yeah, well, I know more or less what it entails if you ask me what... No, but but, that, that was your but I've never been one, so I've never done it, and in that sense I don't know what it entails. Yes. So here you meet with, with, with someone who's been newly appointed, mm. and um, he certainly presses all your right buttons. Yes. He says, no, we must look at this case, we must look at that case. No, no, no. Uh, not because of that. His general overview of where he wanted to go with the NPA, appreciating the difficulties the NPA was in at that time. Um, his ideas about uh, how he was going to go about fixing it, um, appreciating the, the size of the job, even though I've never done it, I can also appreciate that it's a very large job. Uh, and the difficulties and, and the kind of support that he would need to, to try and succeed, not for his own sake, but for the sake of the national prosecution. Those are the things that impressed me. Now, now can, I, can I ask no. you two things? Maybe ask you one thing and put another to you. Can I ask you, so why was this opportunity not given to Ms. Jiba when she comes to your office, you the regional head, to sit down with her and to say, you're welcome, let's have a chat. And maybe you would have had the same experience with her. Uh. In fact, you don't say that. You, your evidence, your statement in your affidavit certainly seems to say, not even suggest, like she was coming to ask you for a job. No, she wasn't said, asking me for a no, job. No, no, she was no, telling no, me I'm, she had one. If I can, if I can just um, 
remind you, Ms. Breitenbach, of what you say in your statement. Mm -hmm. You said there was no vacancies. There were. Why, why would you want to say that? Oh. She's not asking for a job, is that right? No, no, she's she telling to tell you, I've got a job. Yes, she, no, she wasn't asking office. me for a job. So why did you write in your affidavit that there were no vacancies? Oh, no, because welcome. that's what I told her, Mr. Aronson. I'm trying to be as uh, truthful in my affidavit as I can possibly remember. And that is certainly what I told her. Uh, Ms. Jeeva came to my office, um, and I assume it was a courtesy for, uh, to tell me that she was starting work there the next week. There was no vacancy in my office. There was no empty deputy director post. There was no office space physically available. And nobody discussed with me this appointment. I was the head of the unit, the regional head of the unit, and nobody discussed it with me. And Ms. Jeeva arrives in my office and says, I'm starting work. I'm coming to tell you that I'm starting work on Monday in your office. So I said to her, but we, we don't have a vacancy. I don't, how does this happen? We don't have a vacancy. It hasn't been advertised. I, the, the now, is, it, is, it, is it fair to tell her or to ask her that, how come you're coming to work here? I don't have a vacancy. I don't need you. No, I didn't well, say I didn't need her, Mr. Arlen, so don't put words in my mouth. Well, why don't you, I mean, who made the, why didn't you go to the decision maker and say to the decision maker, in the first place, I'm the head of this uh, region, this office, you never consulted me, mm. you never even told me, someone rocks up at my office and says, I'm working here. Mm. Uh, Mr. When I raised that issue with Ms. Jeeva, she told me that uh, Mr. Similani had... Uh, made that decision. Uh, again, it's not my job to question what the National Director does, doesn't do. Uh, if Mr. Similani appointed um, uh, Ms. Jiba in my office, then uh, I have nothing to say about it. Uh, I may have been disgruntled, and I certainly was, uh, but I, I certainly don't think that I was rude to Ms. Jiba. Um, I made as much space for her in the office as I could. I uh, asked my colleagues to uh, behave and treat her with the necessary respect, and I hope they did. Um, but was I happy about it? No, not at all. Uh, Ms. Jeeva was perceived then as a, as a bit of a troublemaker, and I, I didn't want her in my office. You didn't like her? I didn't dislike her, Mr. Aron. So at, at, when we were at the Office for Civil Economic Fences, I actually liked her a lot. Uh, she's undergone a, a significant change since then. Uh, I don't know how it came about, and I don't know why it happened. But at the Office for Serious Economic Offences, she was a very pleasant person. She no longer is that pleasant person, in my view. What, 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 she's never been rude to you, has she? She's never personally caused you an affront? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can agree with that, Mr. Aronson. What do you mean, she's never been rude to me? Well, has she... Has she has she sworn at you? Has she no, insulted you? Not. No. She's never insulted you? She's never belittled or denigrated you in front of your colleagues? Well, Mr. Arnold, it would take a brave person to do that for starters. But secondly, um, I regard uh, being put through a disciplinary procedure that was uh, totally uh, baseless as a, as a bit of an insult. Uh, and I certainly regard being prosecuted for no reason at all as a bit of an insult, so I don't agree with you, no. But you, um, as, as you say um, in, your, in your book, which was co-written by uh, um, Ms. Brody, a journalist. Uh, Ms. Brody uh, is not a journalist, she's a serious author and is historian. She a, oh, okay, then, then, mm. then I... She's even more serious than that. She's a, she, you, you very eloquently uh, say that you are committed uh, to the rule of law. Most certainly I am. So <coughs> when, when someone charges you or someone suspends you, then the first requirement would be that they must follow due process. Yeah, well, they didn't. Well, you, you, you were served notice of your suspension and the charges. You were given an opportunity to defend. In, in fact, you were, you were represented uh, by a top 
senior counsel. Certainly, uh, yes, at my own expense, of course. And, um, but that's how it is, Ms. Ms. Breton. Yes. When you prosecute accused persons, if they don't have the means, then, then they must either get legal aid or to get the kind of counsel you had, they must sell their house or take a bond on their house. Yes, well, I was fortunate that's not to, the, have to That's do how that. the system that's works. So, yes. so don't blame Ms. Jeeba for that. Uh, no, Mr. Arms, you misunderstood me. I have no difficulty with the system. Yeah. And I have no difficulty with rule of law. Absolutely not. What I do have a difficulty with is a baseless disciplinary and a baseless prosecution. That's my difficulty. Well, I, uh, I, I think we will probably, um, when it comes to argument at the end, be because I, I, it's, it's not going to serve, Madam Chair, any purpose to, to traverse the transcript of these, of these hearings. It's not, it's not going to get us anywhere. It's I certainly, with respect, going to assist us uh, in, in establishing whether Ms. Jeeba is fit and proper or not. Um, but certainly the disciplinary hearing was, was contested. Spectacularly unsuccessfully, yes. It was unsuccessful and I'm happy right. for you that, that the outcome was the one that you, that you wanted. But you, you got your due process. You were represented by more than able counsel. You put your side of the story an, an independent chairperson um, heard the evidence on both sides and made a decision and you were found not guilty. Yes, that it sounds, sounds to me like what the rule uh, of law is about. Sounds very pretty when you put it that way. Uh, the disciplinary was based on, on the fact that uh, Richard and Lully was being protected and in my view. And uh, certainly subsequent to that I've learnt of course that ICT was uh, uh, finally in control of the Guptas and even more recently I've heard that, uh, that uh, with regards to Basasa I was perceived as being in the way. So, uh, so you'll forgive me if I don't uh, share your uh, glowing view of what happened. No, I, d I don't think I need to em uh, embroider or, or, or put any gloss on this view that I had. I'm, I'm actually just summarizing what's in the NPA disciplinary code and procedure. That's mm. all that I've put to you. Yes, I've answered that you. when someone has a complaint and, and, and they feel there's enough to charge you, they charge you, you get served a notice, maybe a notice of suspension, you, you, the law allows you to challenge it, and then there's a hearing, evidence is led, you get an opportunity to challenge that evidence, to put your side of the story and a decision is made. I've answered you, Mr. Arlington. That sounds to me what due process is about. There's a procedural aspect and there's a substantive aspect. Uh, I've answered you. Do you want another answer? So, no, I'm, I'm not putting, no. Uh. Just, I'm not putting a gloss on I anything. See. Whether ICT or Kumba, whether it involved the Guptas and Luli, that's got nothing to do with it. It applies to you, it applies to anybody in the NPA. Well, not exactly. Uh, the procedure certainly applies to everybody in the NPA, and I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is the institution thereof uh, needs to be based on something. In my view, this was not. That's all I'm saying. But that very institution that you were certainly at that point critical about, and you were clearly very upset that you were now being charged and brought before this inquiry, and as you say, at, at great expense to yourself, that very institution still stuck to the basics of the rule of law. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you said the basics, yes. Well, what else were they supposed to do? Other than to formally charge you, give you proper notice, give you notice of the charges, give you an opportunity, no, those are the maybe basics. applied for further particulars. Those are the basics, I agreed with you. Yes, those, those are yes. the basics. Mm. So, so the institution never fell apart. I'm you're, not you're, sure which institution you're referring to. Well, the institution you've been testifying about, the National Prosecuting uh. Authority. You said on several occasions 
that this institution was beginning to fall apart. Oh, it most certainly was, Mr. Arnson. I think even you know that. Um, I'm not referring to my uh, disciplinary or even my prosecution as the NPA falling apart. Good heavens, no. I'm talking about the other things that they did and didn't do that caused them to fall apart. Uh, you cannot possibly sit here this afternoon and expect me to agree with you that the NPA is functioning even close to optimally. Because it isn't. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, fortunately concerned here with what my client did or didn't do, Ms. Jiba. That's what, what my concern Certainly. is. Certainly. And your and, client and contributed and handsomely and to the mess that the NPA is now in. And, and, I, would and just, I would just ask both of you, if I may, to just give each other an opportunity to ask the question and an opportunity to respond to the question. I apologize, And not fall lady. over each other. I'm sorry, my Okay. Thank you. Ms. Um, yeah, as I said, um, so, so it was certainly at the time when Ms. Jiba was the, the acting head of the N NDPP. Um, your disciplinary inquiry was it at the time when she was uh, dead? Yes, it was. Yes. So, so that hearing took place? Yes. You got a fair hearing? I would think so, yes. Yes. Um, and you were, you were pro so, so due process was observed and followed? Certainly. I had an uh, unbelievably good uh, legal team who saw to it that due process was followed. Why, why are you being so cynical? <laughs> that is what the prescripts require. It is. It's not, it certainly isn't what everybody else experienced. I can uh, certainly think of examples of people who didn't enjoy such a uh, uh, a hearing where good pr due process was followed, I had a, the kind of legal team that could ensure it. You haven't testified about any of these other examples? I haven't been asked. Well, why should I, I ask you, Ms. Bauer, ask you? If you're asking me, I'll answer you, but if you're not answering me, then I'm not sure what you're saying. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you questions in relation to your evidence that you've given thus far. And your evidence thus far, as far as Ms. Jiba is concerned, is that you had a fair hearing when you were disciplined. Yes, I don't think uh, that I mean to say or convey the message that I think that Ms. Jiba was responsible for that. Yeah. I mean to convey that I had the kind of legal team that ensured it. I'm sorry if, the, if I expressed myself poorly. Well, let's, let's, let's examine that. Why... why is, is, it, is it her job? Is it any NDPP's job to ensure a certain outcome? Surely all that they are required to do as administrators, as good administrators, is to ensure that, that the proper procedures are put in place. A chairperson is appointed, evidence leader, you are entitled to be legally represented, and then the rest must take its course. What, what, why, I'm not why? sure what you mean if you say, is it anybody's job to ensure an outcome? Of course not. No, no, no. I, I was asking you because part of this inquiry is, is while Ms. Jiba was acting as the National Director of Public Prosecutions, did she display, did she display um, the, the, the kind of um, um, characteristics that would be required of a leader of the NPA. And where we were focused on now was your disciplinary hearing. Yes, which is a... And as far as that is concerned, her job as the, as, as the administrative head of the NPA was simply to ensure that where you are charged, that you are given a hearing and hopefully a fair hearing. It's always going to depend on who represents you at the end of the day. It's going to depend on who the presiding officer is. But that's, that's not her job. That's my point. It's not her job or any NDPP's job when, when a hearing is convened.
you, you look puzzled. I'm having trouble following you, but, but carry on. When you okay, finish the question, question perhaps I'll understand maybe better. Maybe yeah. Is it a question or is it a... I, I, put, it, a I put it to Ms. Breitenbach. Statement. That, that in her capacity as the uh, acting national director of public prosecutions, Ms. Breitenbach um, was given a hearing, it was a fair hearing, and due process was followed. And this happened under the watch of Ms. Jiba. And I have replied, and I'll reply again. It is my view that the fact that uh, due process was followed and that I had a hearing and a fair one was because my legal team was uh, there to ensure that that happened. Now, now you see, you, the, the problem with your, is with your response, like so many, it is always suggestive of some kind of motive, always some ulterior or bad motive. Because you saying that your hearing was only fair because of your legal team. That's my view. So, and the presiding officer, of course. So, so, so the flip side is that if it wasn't for your legal team, your top legal team, you would not have had a fair hearing. That's my view. Apart from the presiding officer, of course. And apart from who else? Just the presiding officer? Yes. So, so who appointed the presiding officer? Uh, the National Prosecuting Authority did, but they went through three. They went through three, but finally the person appointed, you didn't have a, a, an objection to that person? I had no objection to any of them. And even if I did have misgivings, I raised no objection to any of them. Yes. Hmm. So, so isn't that a key aspect of a fair hearing? Is is, is, is the appointment of an independent chairperson of a hearing. Well, Does, uh, doesn't that give you some confidence that you're going to be heard fairly? Mr. Arantzer, you and I both know that that's not necessarily so. But uh, uh, my answer is a simple one. The, I have no issue with any of the presiding officers. It is my view that I got a fair hearing from all three of them, in as much as they were involved. And that the fact that my hearing proceeded at the pace that it did, the fact that it proceeded timelessly, and the fact that it was a fair one in that sense, was because I had a really good legal team. I had no uh, doubt that the MPA had no interest in giving me a fair hearing. You see, your answer is suggestive of this that if it wasn't for your legal team, you would have not have received a fair hearing. I'm sorry if you think it's suggestive. I'm stating it so. I'm not suggesting it. I'm saying it is so. That's my view. Well, then I want to put it to you, Ms. Breitenbach, that no one can take you seriously when you, when you say categorically that you only got a fair hearing because of your legal team. That's your view. No, no, that's your view. You, you know, your question was, I'm starting to be really chasing each other around in circles here. Your view, your question was, no one can take me seriously if that's my view. I'm saying that's your view, that no one can take me seriously if that's my view. You, you see, we, we are stuck on this because I put a very simple proposition to you, which you seem to have difficulty in accepting is that under Ms. Jeeva's watch, when you were charged and you were disciplined, the, the, the hearing that was convened, that was held, the outcome that was in your favor, all that happened under her watch. Now, it's very simple. I would have expected, yes, that happened. But in broad strokes, I've agreed with you. I've told you what my issues are. Not because you wanted to say yes, and she doesn't say yes. She doesn't agree with you. She doesn't agree with you because she qualifies it by saying that the role that her legal team and perhaps the presiding officer played <coughs> contributed to the success. 
And that's not the, the response that you want to hear. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, can we, can we at least agree that uh, the appointment of the chairperson of the hearing was as a result of the NPA as a structure under the leadership of Majiba was responsible for appointing this independent chairperson? Well, Mr. Arons, it's trust that uh, the employer appoints the presiding officer, so yes. Now, we also know, since we're now at this disciplinary hearing, that the complaint was uh, a complaint from an outside attorney, isn't that, Mr. Mendelo? Yes. <coughs> so, so this wasn't a complaint that was cooked by Ms. Jiba or someone else within the NPA? Uh, not as far as I'm aware, no. So to come back to the question, so why would you think that if it wasn't for your top legal team that you may not have or would not have received a fair hearing? Well, Mr. Mr. Aronson, I think that it happened up to that point uh, gave me confidence that I would get a fair hearing or that the NPA was mildly objective. Uh, in my view, the Mendelo complaint was spurious, it's still my view. Uh, if it had been one of my prosecutors accused of that and I had to decide on a disciplinary, I can tell you right now that it's unlikely that there would have been a hearing based on the Mendelo complaint. Uh, and uh, so given that, uh, my view is that the Mendelo complaint was not the basis of my disciplinary. That it was used as an excuse. I've made no secret of that view. Uh, as you say, all my documents are before you and I've expressed that view several times. I believe that the Mendelo complaint was used as a convenient excuse to remove me from the Mdluli matter. And uh, in retrospect now, knowing more than I knew then, certainly from the, uh, from the ICT matter and the uh, Vasasa matter. Now, assuming that you are correct factually on all those three things that you've mentioned that you were removed, um, there's no evidence that it's Ms. Jiba, is there? Uh, Ms. Jiba suspend, uh, purported to suspend me. Ms. Jiba signed my uh, letter of suspension. Um, Ms. Jiba signed the memorandum for my suspension. Uh, Ms. Jiba was the NDPP when I, or acting NDPP when I was suspended. Ms. Jiba was in control of my disciplinary. So yes, um, I don't know how you avoid her involvement. That, that, that brings me neatly to the next theme. Mm. We, the first one was we, we were discussing the implications of your statements about Ms. Jiba's appointment. And I think we made some headway. The, the second one was that the all your matters, your disciplinary went to an independent tribunal. I think it's Mr. Colley is now a judge. judge well, it was first, uh, it was first uh, uh, one of the DPPs or in deputy DPPs from, I think, the Transkai from Tata. Uh, when he made an unfavorable decision for the NPA, he was removed. Uh, then it was uh, Mr. Sandide July. Uh, when he did something to upset the MPA, I'm not sure what it was, he was removed, and then it was Mr. Mbeningwe. So, so, um, so there you had a hearing in front of a, a, an independent chairperson, and your suspension matter and your transfer matter, that went to the Labour Court, uh. and your suspension went to the CCMA. That's correct. So there were legal pronouncements they were. on all of these issues? Yes, they were. And do you accept, as, as someone who believes in the rule of law, that in none of them did they find or rule that Ms. Jiba was responsible and that she, was, she had an ulterior motive 
or after the rationally for suspending you or for transferring you? Well, Mr. Uh, certainly the Labour Court matters, I was unsuccessful in both of them. Um, I don't really have much recollection of, of those judgments. I took it on review and we later abandoned that as a part of an agreement with Mr. Nkosana. Um, certainly in the disciplinary, um, Mr. Benengi was uh, quite scathing about the NPA. Uh, he found no evidence whatsoever upon which to, uh, to, to uh, base the, the charges, so um, that certainly didn't cover um, Mr. Jiba and Glory. But certainly, you, when you went to court and you gave the kind of evidence that you've given here today, neither, and we can go to the judgments um, um, mm -hmm. if, if we have to. The, the, the two judgments, Judge Pele and the other one of uh, Judge Rapkin Naika, and then also the um, Bargaining Council mm -hmm. decision. The Bargaining Council ruling was, in fact, that your suspension was both procedurally and substantively fair. Yes. Not one that I agreed with, but that was the judgment, and I have no truck with it. That's fine. That's how life works. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. My remedy was a review, and I instituted one. But you never pursued it? No, as part of an agreement with Mr. Nkosana. So, so why must mm. the panel today, or any one of us in this room, be unhappy? with your treatment <laughs> and visit it upon Ms. Jiba. I, don't. I think your difficulty is you turn away from the mic Sorry. and uh, the panel sometimes doesn't hear it's you. It's an age issue here, <laughs> so you must speak loud. Yes. Can you kindly just be conscious and uh, maybe Sorry. your uh, colleague Mr. Masuku can time in again you know, nudge you into. Thank you. Amen. Look after him, Mr. Masuko. Um. <laughs> so, uh, unless we, I mean, we could obviously save a lot of time if we don't have to traverse these judgments. The one of Pele, uh, Rebka Naika, judges of the Labour Court, I don't, and, dispute and the the, I don't dispute the judgments. Yeah. They are what they are. Yeah. I took them on review. And, and, and at the time, the, uh, the facts of, the, of, the, of these various matters, um, they were a lot fresher in your mind. They were a lot fresher in the mind of all the witnesses who deposed to affidavits and, and the judges, who, the respective judges mm -hmm. who heard the case at the time. I have no issue with the judges or the judgments. Yes. It is how the law works, and I understand that very, very well. So, so you accept that there was no ulterior motive behind your suspension, and that certainly Ms. Jiba was not that person who had such no. a motive. No, Mr. Mr. Answer again, you're putting words in my mouth very cleverly, but nevertheless. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm mm. trying to. I do not accept that, Mr. Answer. Well, then I accept you don't that accept that, that was. No, no, no. I accept that that's what the judgments found. I don't have to agree with the judgments, and I don't. I hold the view that there is an ulterior motive, and nothing will move me from that. But that the judgments say what they said, I accept. And I have no issue with it. That is how the law works. You win some, you lose some, we all nice and big. I have no issue with it. They say what they say. I don't dispute that. That they didn't find an ulterior motive, I agree with you. That's not my view. My view is there was an ulterior motive. But you see, it brings us to, to a, a, a further... So, sorry, it brings us to a further theme, and that is the, the public trust and confidence in the NPA, which, which is at stake. And, and here we have a situation where um, a matter has gone to court yes. on several occasions. It's gone to the bargaining council. Um, it's been settled. The dispute has been resolved. Um, and the, the resolution of that dispute says that 
the NPA in the form of Ms. Jiba didn't have an ulterior motive. You disagree with that and you, you're quite entitled to disagree. But I'm, I'm concerned and I think we are all concerned that, that some of these judgments of courts of law, which plays of course a central role in upholding the rule of law, is somehow lost in the wash. Mr. Arnsen, first of all, I don't, I don't agree with um, your, your submission that uh, they found that there was no ulterior motive. I don't believe either of them grappled with that issue. They grappled with different issues. They didn't find it necessary to grapple with that issue, and there was no finding in that regard, in my recollection. If I'm wrong, then I bow to your superior knowledge. You're way more experienced than I am. But in my view, that is not something they grappled with, and so it's not a finding that they made. Uh, that the that, that I was unsuccessful in, in both of those endeavours, I absolutely agree with you. Did I like the fact that I was unsuccessful? No. Did I agree with the, the finding uh, in, the, where was it, the one in Centurion? The Bargaining Council. The Bargaining Council. The Bargaining Council. Uh, no, I took it on review, as one does. Uh, people dispute uh, judgments every single day. That doesn't mean that you don't have respect for the court. It doesn't mean that you don't have respect for the law. It doesn't mean that you don't have respect for the presiding officers. Of course I do. Most certainly. The fact that I disagree with them doesn't uh, distract from the fact that I have respect for, for the rule of law, for the South African judicial system, and for the criminal justice system. I most certainly do, and I think I've demonstrated that over and over again. I don't have to agree with every single judgment, and disagreeing with it in a fashion that is allowed for in law does not equate to, uh, to uh, negating the rule of law. I don't agree with that for one moment. So, so can, can we accept that what you say is that you abide the rulings that were given in the two labor court matters and the award that was given in the bargaining council? Um, you respect it, although you don't agree with the outcome. Yes, I didn't agree with the finding, no. So we can That's why I took it on review. Yeah, this is, I'm just reading to you from, this is the um, no, Repka Nike. The Repka Nike um, judgment at paragraph 17, um, the conclusions drawn by the applicant. We always prefer, Mr. Aronson, that you give a, total, a complete citation when you do that. So, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I this is... Um, or you give us a folder. It should, uh, wait, wait. B, uh, B, B4, under the subheading judgments. There's lots of them. <laughs> Don't ask him to help you. Ask the other gentleman to help you, please. <laughs> folder, folder B, document 4, Breitenbach versus the NPA. So give you the case number? No. You, you know you have B4 folder, so there's a folder number. Then you, you don't have to go through. Sometimes we struggle ourselves, like Mr. Moss. Folder B, document 4. Thank you. The, and then and you said para? Paragraph 17. The, the conclusions drawn by the applicant regarding the motive for her original suspension and the subsequent measures taken against her by her employer are not based on primary facts set out in the papers and capable of supporting a cause of action in these proceedings. They are inferences and suspicions which may well have been reinforced after applicants recent acquittal on all the disciplinary charges against her. However, as Nugent J.A. has cogently set out, then, he, uh, uh, then she refers to a, a quote in the case of President of the Republic of South Africa and others versus MNG, Mail and Guardian Media Limited. Um, and I quote, uh, knowledge of the occurrence of an, of an event might come to a person in one of three ways. It might come to him or her through directly experiencing the occurrence of the event, 
or the occurrence might be reported to him or her by someone else. Or he or she might deduce that the event has occurred by inference from other facts. If knowledge of the occurrence of the event has come to a witness from direct observation, then his or her evidence is admissible to prove it occurred. If that knowledge was acquired from someone else, then a proper basis must be laid for admitting it as hearsay and enabling its weight to be evaluated. And if the knowledge was acquired only by inference, then that is not evidential material at all. It is for a court to draw the inference itself upon proof of primary facts. So it, it, is, on, it is on that basis that the, the court found um, that there was no evidentiary basis to make a finding that there was some ulterior motive for your suspension. I'm familiar with the judgment. Now that I've reminded you. No, I'm familiar with I was with trying you. to help you. Thank you. So, um, <coughs> so we, we, we can accept all of us in this room, including the panel, we, we're sitting with these judgments that have been passed, that have been made. Some like it, some don't like it. The, the, the judgment that you're aware of, I'm, I'm maybe jumping the, the gun, but since I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with, 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 with the rule of law and courts of law and the decisions that we must respect handed down by courts of law, you know that the Supreme Court of Appeal have recently found um, that Ms. Jiba is indeed fit and proper. She's indeed a fit and proper person. I'm perfectly aware of that, yes. Also aware that the General Counsel of the Bar is uh, yeah. and challenging and it's, it's that. on appeal. Yes. yes. It's on appeal. But again, as we speak, uh, whether you like it or not, mm. we've got to accept it. Uh, you, you may hold that view. There are many judgments that differ with that SCA judgment. Uh, and uh, I think that the proof of the pudding will be in the eating thereof. So let's see what happens with the appeal. Yes, but certainly, certainly um, in relation to, for example, the Mrudli matter. Yes. Um, or the poison matter. There, there were differences amongst all the judges who heard. The majority of judges still found in favour of Ms. Jiba. Yes, they did. I don't dispute that. It's a matter of record. Yes. So whatever view there is, is a minority view as we speak. At the moment, yes. Yes. In terms of the SCA. So, so, so there's no difficulty in accepting that is the law. That's it is the, the current is. position. That, that's what it's pronounced. It is the current position, yes. But certainly when one reads the media, certain media, then one won't believe that that's the case. I'm not sure which media you're referring to. Okay. Um, the... the, the um, Ma'am, just before I go on to the next topic, is it possible to have a short comfort break? Five minutes. You see, when I talk about age, just I don't think we can deny you that. Thank you. Absolutely not. I would hate to deal with the consequences if we did. <laughs> <laughs> can we adjourn for five minutes? Will five minutes be all right for you? Thank you. I'm sure we don't need to go out. You need to go out. Well, we don't know why you want a five-minute break. <laughs> you can use the break, but kindly be back within five minutes. Maybe we should also go. Yes. Should we go? OK, only Mr. Are you going to stay? It's very hard. Yeah. I'm very suspicious. <laughs> 
happy we should leave. Yeah. Because if we leave, then everybody will take a chance to leave. Yeah. But kindly be back within five minutes.
We will proceed. Mr. Ellison. Th thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, on the basis that there is um, so much material, in the Dropbox, <laughs> identified and unidentified. Um, there, there's much uh, arguments left to be made. We don't have any further questions for, for, um, for Ms. Breitenbach. Thank you, Ms. Breitenbach. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Aronser. Mr. Ripp, the witness is yours. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Ms. Breitenbach, hopefully we won't be too long. There are certain issues that we need to touch on, and, and again, also on a similar basis to Mr. Arensa, um, you clearly have very strong opinions about a number of things, and I don't think there's any purpose in us debating your opinions here at this stage. We have, the documentation is there. Mr. Murebi will deal, Advocate Murebi will deal with it. He's a, expressed his opinions, but there are certain aspects that I do wish to canvas with yourself. Certainly. And, um, Early on in your evidence, you said that you um, believed that when you heard uh, um, about the Mudluli investigation or potential prosecution, you thought and you had a fear that there would be interference therein. And you mentioned four, I made notes of four, four factors that you mentioned. The first was that he was well connected. Second was that he was in a very high position within the police. The third was flowing from um, what Advocate Smith had told you with his difficulty to obtain documents that he required for his investigation, which seemed to imply someone was running interference on the document side. And then also I think from Smith that he'd been under pressure, or Smith's predecessor had been under a lot of pressure not to do well in the prosecution. I think those are the four sort of... I'm sorry. Uh, unless um, I must, but you yeah. can correct me. That's that's those are my may I, notes. May I correct Certainly. You? Okay. Uh, I may have expressed myself poorly, and if I did, I apologise. I agree with the well connected, and I agree with the high position. Uh, what I meant to convey with um, difficulty in obtaining documents and finalising an investigation was that Rulofsa had complained about that, not Smith. Uh, I wasn't sure someone had complained. Rulofsa was the investigating officer, and it's really not Smith's job to go out and get documents. I mean, he gets what the police bring to him. Okay. And and his partner, there were two investigators on the matter initially. One was for Leon. He left because he said I can't take the pressure. Okay. So it was the I got yeah. the, I got it wrong. So, so, so it was the investigator, not yeah. the prosecutor, who was so under that, pressure. Those were my issues. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Now I'll 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 get back to that in a moment. This, the second thing I wish to deal with you is that throughout your affidavit and your evidence, you've had very negative and quite strongly worded opinions to express about what you thought would happen with the Midluli investigation uh. or prosecution. Yes. Um, you used words such as nefarious, there were appointments for ulterior motives, um, interference would be run, etc, etc. Uh. Am I correct, and, and just help me if I'm wrong, that you had this impression that the Madluli prosecution would never happen and that someone somewhere would ensure that it wouldn't happen? Well, I had a fear that that was going to happen. I had, uh, I didn't have a view that that's what would happen. I suspected that that's what was uh, being attempted. I was quite determined that the opposite would happen, that there was a case to be answered and that Mr. Mglouli would answer the case. No, if he was convicted, so be it. If he was acquitted, so be it. But that there was a case to be answered, and Mr. Mglouli is no different to you, <coughs> or me, or anybody else. And if there's prima facie evidence against you, then you must stand trial, unless there's another compelling reason to not prosecute. And yes. there were none in this matter. But I don't have to tell you that, you know it. Yes. So. The aspect that we are struggling with is why did you have this feeling? Because, because we don't know where that feeling comes from. Mr. Mr. Ripp, I've been a prosecutor for 26 years. I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly gifted, but I'm also not particularly stupid. 
you can call it a gut feeling, you can call it uh, evaluating the landscape, you can call it observing what's happening around you and not being oblivious to it, all of those things. So I can't say to you one thing and, and that's the reason. But a variety of things were happening in the NPA, a variety of things were happening elsewhere, uh, and it all built up to, to this feeling, and the events have borne it out. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, Lily has not been prosecuted. Well, not yet on, on the corruption charges. Yes, yeah, well, well, I don't know if any of us are going to live long enough, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I understand the other charges, there is a prosecution underway on the murder and some of the no, violence. No, no, you charges. see, again, it's a watered-down prosecution. I, it's I don't not know. on murder. I don't it's know not what even on charge. attempted murder. It's on I uh, do not want to do the same thing that Sorry, I did earlier. Kindly, just, just do it the way it should be done. Yes, my Give lady. each other an opportunity <laughs> to say what you, would, um, you want to say. And don't be impatient. You know, just, just give opportunities to each other to ask and to respond. Yeah. Yes, my lady. Thank you, ma'am. So, I think you want to add anything about the prosecution? No, in my view, the, the matter running in South Gauteng um, is somewhat watered down. Uh, okay, I just know that it was a prosecution. Okay. Now, um, Advocate Ferreira, under cross-examination, and I only got the record while we were busy with you, um, said, but I don't think it will be an issue, that, that he said when asked by my learned friend next to me about this narrative of, uh, of interference and a, I don't know if it's a conspiracy might be too strong a word, to not prosecute McLuley, um, where there was any evidence that this was the case and, and Advocate Ferreira indicated that there was no evidence, he didn't have any evidence and that's why that issue was not raised in your memorandum of April 2012. Yes, it wasn't, as far as I can recall, it wasn't raised. And as I said to you, I don't have one single thing that I can haul out and say, this is it. It was a culmination of things, uh, various factors. Okay, now, you will agree that you've mentioned fear, fearless, etc. I can also refer you to the rules of conduct, which says that, in, and we debated this with some of the previous witnesses, that you should only enter into a prosecution when you are, when you believe that you have got uh, the right evidence to ensure proper prosecution, or words to that effect. I can get you the exact words. Sure. So, it's, so, it's, so the, the point I wish to make to you is that, and, and Advocate Ferreira conceded this, although he said in he, his opinion was there was enough, but every prosecutor must form an opinion on whether or not they believe there's sufficient, reliable evidence. Um, my junior has given it to me. It says 10.1d um, of the Code of Conduct says, in the institutional criminal proceedings, proceed when a case is well-founded upon evidence reasonably believed to be reliable and admissible and not continue a prosecution in the absence of such evidence. Yes, I would agree with that. So, the point I wish to make to you is that Prosecutors can have different opinions on whether or not they think the evidence is reliable and admissible uh, or not. Certainly. And you have indicated a very strong opinion that in the McLuley matter you felt there was enough evidence for the prosecution on the corruption charge. I it's just, uh, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing that relates to the sale of the BMW yes. vehicles. That's the only thing that was in the docket when I was still at the NPA. Yes. Now, Advocate Murebi formed a, a different view, that he believed that there was documentation that was required to prove the connection between Bardenost and with Luli and the intelligence fund to show the movement of the money and to prove the, the fraud and theft in the alternative, I would imagine. Um, and that, that being the case, he wasn't convinced at that stage that the evidence was there uh, to prove the matter. And that he also believed, and this is where the, in, uh, uh, the Inspector General comes into it, that some of that evidence would be um, 
under lock and key as part of the intelligence community in that it's their money and their transaction that was actually taking place and to put the whole package together you needed that evidence. What do you say about that I viewpoint? I differed very strongly with Advocate Murebi then and I still differ from him today. And but I'm not alone in differing from him. No, no, you, uh, some mm. other people have also differed from mm. him. But I'm putting to you what Advocate Murebi's viewpoint I understand. Uh, um, then and now mm. will be. Furthermore, that um, your evidence that now, I got confused there, but that Colonel Rulofs, the investigating officer, had indicated that he couldn't get documents that he thought he required for the, the, for the purposes of this um, McLuhan prosecution on that respect, supports Advocate Marebi's belief that those documents were being withheld from the, the intelligence community of the police and that they were necessary to, to make the prosecution work successfully. I, I didn't mean to indicate that Rulofs couldn't get the documents. I meant to indicate that he had had enormous difficulty obtaining them because people had obstructed him. But that after the intervention of his superiors, he had got them. And they were in the docket. <coughs> and they were sufficient in that docket to prosecute that charge. Completely at that time, as it was. In my that? view. So you, you could have gone to trial on the 14th of December without it, any postponements? Or no, anything. no, it wasn't a trial date. There were still things that need to be tied up. It was a provisional date. But by the time it went to trial, there would have been sufficient. Now, I put it to you that your strong view that you'd formed about this conspiracy that had come about as to how the prosecution of, of General Madluli would be prevented has clouded your view of what uh, Advocate Mwebi did and, and his decision to at that time not prosecute. No, I'm afraid I can't agree with you. I do have a strong view. Um, I don't believe it clouded my thinking on this particular matter. Um, my thinking on this particular matter was that there was a prima facie case that needed to be answered. Um, and that Mr Mwebi uh, had interfered in the matter before his appointment when he had no right to do so. That he had disregarded the position of Mr. Mzniati, which he in law couldn't do, uh, and for those reasons uh, I objected to his decision. And for that reason we wrote to Ms. Jiba and asked her to review it. So we'll, get, we'll get to that. Okay. That's in April. Uh, on the 9th of December you had the, the, the in-person meeting between you and Ms. Zinyati and Muebi. Yes. And my instructions are, and I understand from an affidavit filed by Advocate Nzinyati, that whilst Nzinyati at first was not keen on the prosecution, he agreed that the charges could be provisionally withdrawn later. You're in agreement with that? Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Well, whilst he initially said, initially he was opposed to the withdrawal of the charges. Oh, yes, on the he was keen on the prosecution. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then in that same meeting, he later agreed that it could be provisionally withdrawn and that investigation would continue. Well, uh, as I said, we, ag we both agreed that the matter would be provisionally withdrawn, not because we didn't think there was a case, and not because we thought that removing it from the role was a necessity. Uh, we agreed to the provisional withdrawal because Mr. Mkhwebe had already, he told us that he'd already informed the defence. And nobody was prepared to send a prosecutor to court to say did, didn't, did, didn't, did. It's unseemly no, and I'm unprofessional. And for that reason, so we had to sort out the impasse between Mkhwebe and Ms. Nyati. And uh, Mr. Mkhwebe had raised an issue about the RGI, and that was uh, one, of the reasons, one of the things that we then sorted out. But they were, in my view, not, uh, the, the RGI thing was not material to whether the prosecution should go ahead or not. I had no difficulty that it should. And the IGI has nothing to do with criminal investigations or prosecutions. We'll get to that as well. I, I actually, we actually agree with you. On the 9th of December 2011, I'm reading from an affidavit. Now, I don't know if you have a copy of this affidavit, but for record purposes, it's in folder G of the, of the Dropbox. It's item 3. I think Whose it's, affidavit is it? It's page 1482. It's the affidavit of um, Mr. Minzniati. Can you give me that reference again? Folder G, item 3, it's page 1482. It's an affidavit in the Freedom Under Law matter. 
It's called a confirmatory affidavit, but it goes a bit further than confirm. Deposed to by Munzanyati on 10 September 2013. No, just read it to me and I'll tell you if I agree. So he says, on 9 December 2011, that's paragraph 9 of, of that document, on 9 December 2011, I and Advocate Breitenbach held a meeting with Advocate Mwebi in his office in Westlake Avenue, Weaven Park in Silverton, the NPA head office. During our meeting, I initially disagreed with Advocate Mwebi's decision that the matter should be withdrawn. I think we're in agreement on that. Yes. The other issue which he raised was that the investigations were incomplete and the matter was not ripe for trial. After, extensions, after extensive discussions, we agreed that the matter should be withdrawn provisionally so that the investigating officers can work with the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence to conduct uh, further investigations. Advocate Mkhwebi informed Advocate Breitenbach that once the investigations were completed, she could re-enroll the matter for trial. Uh, well, in broad strokes, I suppose uh, he's saying more or less what I'm saying. Um, my evidence is clear on that matter, and I, I have no reason to change it. Um, if that's how he recalls it, well, so be it. That's certainly not how I recall it. And it wasn't for Advocate Mkhwebi to tell me the matter could be re-enrolled. It was up to Ms. Nyati to do that. Just on that point, um, there seems to be some confusion about that, because in your own affidavit you indicated that Ms. Nyati had referred the complaint I think the Kimberley complaint to Mukwebi for further action. Or yes, unbeknownst to me, yes. Why do you think that was done? I've got no idea. Um, I suspect he was instructed to do so. Who, and who would have instructed him to I do so? I honestly don't know. Then, um, we have the documents here, but I don't think it's in dispute. Um, Advocate Mukwebi received from the Minister of Justice, Mr. Rodebi at the time, on the 7th of November, a letter telling him of his appointment as the, the Special Director of Public Prosecutions. I can hand you... It's not in dispute. Uh, we know that this is before the, the, the proclamation, but would it not be normal, and certainly I think Advocate Mugwebi saw it that way, that from that point in time, having had the letter of appointment, um, no. The appointment says, with effect from 1 November 2011. Uh, no, it certainly isn't normal. A, uh, everybody else was unaware of that. But B, the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit in Pretoria resorted under Advocate Mizniati and the DPP's office. And that was to remain the position until March of the next year. Until the end of March, because the office of which Mr. Mkhwebi was now appointed was a non-thing. It was him at the head, like your Don had been, with I think two or maybe three other people doing what? I have no idea. Because the SECU's resorted under the DPPs. And that position hadn't changed. And nobody instructed us that it changed. Nobody informed us that it changed. And so that was my view. I reported to Ms. Nyati. Okay, uh, we understand your view, but from... And it wasn't, I'm sorry, it wasn't sorry. for me to sort that issue out. It was an issue that existed between Mkhwebi and Mzniati, and they needed to sort it out, and then inform everybody else what it was. So until somebody informed me otherwise, I reported to Mzniati. Now, we understand your view, but what we want to put across is Advocate Mkhwebi's view as to why he was doing some s certain steps. Hmm. And Advocate Mkhwebi could not have labored under that misapprehension. He knew what the position was. So then Advocate Mkhwebi and Advocate Mzniati should have had a discussion. Before he started issuing instructions to somebody or a unit that fell under the, 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 the authority of Advocate Mizniati. It's only, for any other reason, it's only just courtesy. Okay, well, then we'll agree to disagree on that aspect, but the document does say it's appointed from 1 November 2011. The, the issue then, then we get to um, the letter which you call the letter the closed letter, where Advocate Mkhwebi writes a letter and he says the matter is now closed. Oh, yes. um, you've dealt with that already. Uh -huh. My instructions are that Advocate Mkhwebi, when he said that, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, did you understand that that meant that the prosecution would not continue at all anymore? That I certainly did. 
like it was a nolo prosecu or something that to that effect. He, the matter had been withdrawn and it was never going to be re-enrolled, yes. Because Advocate Mukwebi says that wasn't the intention of what that letter was. And then was. he chose an unfortunate turn of phrase. That might be so. I think you'll even concede that. But what okay. Advocate Mukwebi says was that what he was considering to be closed is this whole debate about whether you can talk to IGI, who must investigate what, and the t and the toing and froing between your officers and and his officers. That's what he had in mind well, when when he said that. I don't have it in front of me right now, but I can tell you that I don't think any reasonable person on a reasonable reading of that letter would understand that. And if that's what Mr. Mkwebi intended to say, it is certainly not what he wrote. And that when we deal with the IGI, what Advocate Mkwebi meant, or not IGI, with the IG, it shows my age a bit. Is it the IGI? <laughs> is it the IGI? It's to be an insurance company like that. Yeah. Um, and, um, Inspector General of Intelligence. Your, <laughs> Somewhat of your a attorney will remember Mr. Nossel as well. <laughs> but um, um, the Inspector of, of Intelligence, yes. Well, you will say that that reference, that what they had to investigate wasn't a police investigation or to take over the police investigation, but to investigate the paper trail in respect of the... Um, confidential or classified documents that would have fallen within their bureau um, flowing from the um, criminal intelligence unit of so the police. Unless you have a very different letter to the one that I read, no human being with a reasonable reading could glean that from that letter or any of the other correspondence. Well, Mr. Advocate Mukhebi will say that's what the intention was. It was never the intention that they can take over the investigation from Colonel Rulofs or any other uh, pol the police unit that was tasked with the matter. I can unfortunately not read Advocate Mukhebi's mind. I can only read what he sends on paper, and that is not what he said. Well, I'll put to you what his version is. And uh, duly noted. Then... The issue of um, the performance of, of the um, unit, Advocate Mukwebi will say that the Special Crimes Unit under his leadership did no worse than they had previously done. He's handed me a document which, which I only got now just after lunch. Um, headed the performance of the SCCU Pretoria, which, um, and he does, I think he, he deals with this in his, in, his, in his CV as well, where he says that in the 2014-2015 year they did so well they got a special award to show that percentage-wide there was no significant change. In fact, in the 2014-2015 date they reached 95.6% convictions out of 144 matters. I can show you the document. document. I don't know if you wish to comment on it. I, do. Yes, I think we would also like to, to see that document. I don't know what document it is. Uh, it's the document that was handed to me 15 minutes ago. By um, who? Uh, by, my, by Advocate Mkhwebi. Um, yeah, look, uh, Mr. Ripa, I found myself. Please give it to the... No, I'm not intending to ambush you. I, I was just given yeah. a document. Look, I no. find myself in a, in a difficult position because, uh, as you are aware, I sit on the Justice Portfolio Committee in Parliament, and so I see these stats um, also there. Um, I would need to go and have a look if that's what was presented to us. I'm not at all sure. And you, I'd like to make sure that you're comparing apples with apples. So it's easy to say a conviction rate of X, a conviction rate of what? You can prosecute one case, get one conviction, and have a 100% conviction rate. It's nothing to write home about. No, I understand you. I understand so, the way, so I'm the way not able it's... to comment on that. I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I'll just have a moment, please. Sure. Is I, my instructions from, from Advocate Mkhwebi is that he says there's a difference between the reporting line 
and the hands-on activities as him being the head of the of the SCCU he could take decisions and he had the authority to take decisions on behalf of the SCU obviously in consultation with the DPP where necessary and that what you are talking about is, is a reporting line rather than a, a line function, so to speak. And I don't. I don't agree, and neither did uh, Mr. Mizniati. Then also, um, Advocate Mukhebi, I don't know if you know it, but he started prosecuting in 1978, and he's been involved with prosecutions ever since then till now. It's the only profession he's ever. Uh, occupied. I don't dispute that for one moment. And before he came to Pretoria in 2009, for six years he'd been head of the regional DSO in KwaZulu Natal. That is correct. Um, I did discuss that in my evidence. It wasn't the uh, most successful uh, endeavour. Well, we can deb uh, we can argue that in due course of how successful he can tell his version, and then. The promotion you got wasn't the same type of astonishing promotion as you feel about um, Advocate Chiba. It was that was one rank up from where he was. It was a, a normal one rank up. Yes. The, the the surprising thing about his promotion was not the elevation in rank, although um, I did hold the view that there was no foundation for the elevation. Uh, but that's irrelevant. Uh, the the astonishing thing about his appointment to that particular position was that he'd been so vociferous and critical of the SECU and its existence. And now, all of a sudden, he was heading up this unit that he, on many occasions, said shouldn't exist. Well, my instructions from Advocate Mukhebi is that he disagrees with you on your statement that he was vociferously opposed to the disestablishment of that unit. I'm sure he disagrees. I sat in the management meetings with him, and I heard him with my own ears. Thank you. Those are our questions for today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rep. Are you ready for re-examination? Advocate Bauer? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, advocate Breiton, who was Toko Mojokweni? Toko was is, is Advocate Toko Mojokweni. She was, um, for a long time, the special director of the uh, SACA unit, the, um, the unit that deals with um, sort of child molestation and, and, and more social types of issues, uh, but never less criminal. Um, she ran the unit for a long, long time. She was uh, successful at it, and, uh, and then she for a long time was a, um, a Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions. She would be one of the black females that you referred to in your evidence with Advocate Arantza earlier today. Most certainly. There was much, much in your cross-examination about fair due process due disciplinary inquiry, and you then said it wasn't so much what occurred during the inquiry because I had a good legal team at the time headed up by Vam Tringro, if I recall. Indeed. It was what preceded that inquiry. Is that, is that what your point was? Well, that, uh, what preceded it was patently unfair, uh, and the NPA certainly didn't... Um, uh, boxed by the Marquis of Queensbury rules. Um, so yes, that that uh, certainly for, informed my view that the process wasn't and wouldn't be fair. Uh, it is one of the reasons why I appointed a legal team such as the one that I did, so that they would ensure that it was fair. Um, uh, Vim Trengrove, in my view, is certainly one of the best advocates in the country. He is very, very competent, and he, uh, he commands respect. And, uh, and so I knew that between him and, and his junior was Nadine Furi, and uh, Mr. Wachenard was my attorney, I knew that between the three of them, they would ensure that I got a fair trial. And I had no faith in the NPA uh, giving me a fair trial without my legal team. It was put to you that the role of Advocate Jiba was that of an administrator to simply put the proper procedures in place. From where you were sitting at in that disciplinary process, was her role limited to that? No, it's most certainly not. It was common knowledge, and I don't think she'll dispute it, that, um, that the, the legal team who prosecuted me consisted of um, 
uh, William Makari, he was the then leader of the Joburg Bar, he was the lead prosecutor. Uh, he had two juniors, I, I forget their names, it was a gentleman and a lady, um, and then uh, a phalanx of people from the state attorney's office. Um, and it was common knowledge that uh, at adjournments and, uh, and postponements they would all uh, repair to the office of Ms. Jiba to get their instructions. They certainly weren't getting the instructions from anybody else. You, you were referred to the judgment of um, Judge Rapkin Naika in the matter, in one of the Labour Court matters, as to what the finding was in the respect of inferential reasoning. And it was put to you that the Labour Court had essentially rejected the ulterior motive that was premised on, on, uh, on your papers in that case. Um, I want to refer you to the judgment of Sally J, which is the other Labour Court matter. Yes. Um, from paragraph three onwards, and I'm going to the judgment is to be found in folder B, and it's number one. And the citation of the judgment is, sorry, no, it's not one, it's three. Three, it's folder B, number three, and it's Breitenbach versus the NDPP, um, J1397-12, and it's the judgment of Sealy J. And unlike in the rapkin Nike judgment, the respondents' affidavits were, were like the rapkin Nike like a judgment, um, Advocate Jiba was the deponent, but the difference in the two cases was they had sought to bring an application, if you can recall, to have struck out the allegations that you had made in your founding affidavit as being uh, of a vexatious, vexatious nature. I Does vaguely this, recall that. Do you recall that? And the court had the following to say from paragraphs 33 and 34 in describing it. The applicant launched this application principally on the grounds that the suspension was for an ulterior motive, was unfair and had therefore to be set aside. She alleged that the suspension related to the role she played as a prosecutor in the matter involved, Lieutenant General Mluli. The applicant contended that she was suspended in order to protect, protect General Mluli from prosecution. Advocate Jiba was said to have merely used the ICT complaint against the applicant as an excuse to suspend her. In response to these submissions, the respondent said that the applicant had recklessly and falsely made serious allegations against Advocate Jiba. That was said to have been carefully devised by the applicant to divert attention from the serious allegations she was in fact she was facing regarding her conduct, which conduct was said to have tarnished the good name of the NPA and brought the NPA into disrepute. The applicant was said to have persisted with serious unsubstantiated allegations in circumstances in which she knew that those allegations were false and were, were a ploy on her part devised to divert attention from the serious allegations leveled against her. The respondent denied that the allegations contained in the applicant's affidavit relating to the criminal investigations against General Mluli were relevant to these proceedings. It submitted that the allegations were frivolous, irrelevant and vexatious. The conduct of the applicant in this matter was said to amount to an abuse of the court's processes. The respondent not contended that it would be seriously prejudiced if the allegations contained in the applicant's affidavit were not struck out in the sense that the respondent would be required to deal with the irrelevant allegations which were never considered when the decision to suspend the applic applicant was made. A summary of the facts alleged by the respondent to be frivolous, irrelevant and vexatious with the result that the respondent would be seriously prejudiced if the allegations contained in the applicant's affidavit were not struck out as follows, follow you under. And then when he deals with the application to struck out, the judge says, the respondent submitted that the applicant was suspended on the basis, and I'm reading from paragraph 45, the respondent submitted that the applicant was suspended on the basis of alleged misconduct relating to the investigations into the criminal complaint laid against ICT by Session slash Kumba and that she was aware of the true reasons for her suspension. In her affidavit, the applicant sets out in detail the nature of the criminal investigations against General Mluli, the role she played in the case, and the reasons why she believed that she was suspended in order to sidetrack 
the prosecution of Jenny Namluli. It was submitted that the respondent had proved the two requirements for the success of a striking out application, being that the allegations contained in the paragraphs which are subject to this application are scandalous, vexatious, or irrelevant. Severe prejudice, if the allegations contained in the offending paragraphs, are not struck out. Had the respondent sought to discipline the applicant for a role in the general Mluli matter by having recourse to the ICT matter, the respondent would probably not have confessed to it. Accordingly, this issue is not as simple as the respondent would have the court believe. As alluded to before, on 25 November, the applicant was called to a meeting with advocate Karen van Rensburg, the acting CEO of the NPA advocate Damzanyati, and Dr. Ramaiti. The four officials must have had a prior discussion of the matter for which they came to see the applicant. If not, it begs the questions who selected them and why they would take the trouble to participate in an anonymous meeting. On 1 February, the NPA issued a notice of intention to suspend the applicant and publicly announced it. An article in the City Press, City Press reported that the applicant had been suspended and quoted Mr. Maha as having said that all cases she was handling would be reassigned to other equally capable prosecutors within the NPA. Mr. Mahak also confirmed in an interview with Talk Radio on 2 February that the applicant had been suspended. And then it goes on, and the court then comes to the conclusion in paragraph 47, when the totality of these circumstances and facts are seen together, they create a serious doubt on the probabilities, the explanation proffered by the respondent in respect of them. When the applicant initiated this application, she did not know the misconduct with which the respondent would charge her and the details thereof. To aver that she sought to detract attention away from that charge, therefore, has no merit at all. It has to be remembered that she did not seek to attack the charge or charges against her in this application, but rather the suspension, to have the suspension set aside. There is therefore no room for confusion, and the application to strike out is then dismissed. Is that correct? So, so that is it, what happened, yes. So it isn't correct, as what was put to you, that both Labour Court judgments came to the ultimate conclusion that there was no basis of uh, um, put to that. There was no striking out no, there was or no regarding that as being vexatious or completely irrelevant. That's correct. And in fact, there were no costs given against you in that matter either. As far as I'm aware, there were not. Right. I, I have... Sorry, Madam Chair, may I just place on the record that what was put to Ms. Breitenbach, if she recalls, was n n neither of the two judgments found that Ms. Jeebert acted with an ulterior motive or for an ulterior purpose. That was not that yeah. was not the basis that I put these two to be fair, I think. I, I accept that's that. That's what I recall. Mm. I accept that is so, and to the extent there's an inference that you said something different, I, that wasn't my intent. Thank you. You, you alluded to your 26 years as a prosecutor, your gut feeling, your observing of the landscape and a variety of things that was happening. Um, was there anything else you needed to add to that that made you concerned about a connection between either the acting NDPP um, and or General Mluli or and or Advocate Mkhwebi and or General Mluli. Well, certainly, the, the, I mean, the history of the matter speaks for itself. In the in the Salebi matter, uh, both um, Ms. Jiba and Mr. Mkhwebi had been involved in uh, what most prosecutors reviewed as questionable behaviour. Uh, they were involved with uh, Mr. Mluli in that questionable behaviour, and Mr. Mkhwebi, as I recall, uh, testified against the state for Mr. Salebi in that matter. Um, and Mr. Mluli was the, the fellow who was making things happen. So they, they, they were already then involved with each other, and, uh, and that formed uh, some of the uh, basis for my concern. There was also Labour Court proceedings, which Advocate Jiba had brought in relation to her own disciplinary proceedings against the NPA. Is that correct? That is correct, and if I recall correctly, um, uh, Mr. Mluli deposed to quite a lengthy affidavit in support of of Ms. Jiba, and it was um, almost uh, on the heels of the Celebi matter. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bauer. Um, I will ask my panelists if they have any questions. Thank 
Can I just ask, I know you, you might know or you might not know, and if so, please, please indicate. You, the, 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 there is a proposition that uh, when uh, Mr. Mkwebi was appointed in November, he had the authority to then give you instructions. The que my question is not based on that. My question is trying to understand that between November and April, were you aware of any incidents where he also gave you, the, pe the, the people under you or yourselves, any instruction in any other matter? With regards to uh, criminal prosecutions? Yes. No. You are not aware? I, I'm not aware, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Malani. In the absence, yeah. do you have questions arising from that question? Well, maybe one to just clarify your answer. Uh, up until your suspension in April, you remain the regional head of the SCCU yes. and instructions top down would have had to go through you. Uh, if the correct line of uh, reporting was followed, yes. Hmm. Is that it? I have no further questions. from council concerning this question. Are you right? Thank you. Nothing. Thank you. And uh, in the absence of any further questions, can I take the opportunity to thank you, Ms. Breitenbach, for your willingness to assist the inquiry with uh, coming forward with the evidence that uh, you provide it. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, my lady. Yeah. Thank you for your willingness and thank thank your uh, council for accompanying you. Okay. And we thank everybody. <laughs> and we thank everybody for your cooperation, particularly today, and the evidence that you brought to the inquiry, assisted with. Thank you. Having said that, those who travel, travel well. Can we adjourn for the day? Madam Chair, can I just address logistics tomorrow? Yes. In a moment, because... And maybe you'll also let people know what time we start, because I was going to do that. But we can excuse Ms. Breitenbach. Thank you so much. You may go ahead. We have a uh, we have witness that we had hoped to have led last week, which I would like to see if I could probably squeeze in sometime tomorrow. Um, and so we would start with Advocate Amzanyati and then see if we can, and I don't anticipate Advocate Gardner Rensburg's evidence to be very long, but maybe ask for an indulgence that we are able to finish both uh, tomorrow. That would work. If you uh, confer to us, uh, Council, or will you kindly do that if you haven't done it? Yeah, just so that you have an arrangement. Okay, and an understanding, common understanding. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? So you will talk to each other about it. Thank start. you. Yeah. And we start. Can we start at the normal time? I guess so. It will be too soon. I think we will start at the normal time, ten o'clock tomorrow. Okay, and finish at the normal time. All right. If there is a change, if there's a change suggested, yeah, don't worry. If there's a change, you will, we will let you know in time. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. We will adjourn until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs>